You're listening to the ETH podcast today from Hönkerberg campus. My name is Jennifer Kakshuri and I'm in the sound studio of the Media Lab of the ETH Chair of Landscape Architecture, Christoph Giroux. I'm visiting Ludwig Berger. Ludwig, you're a research associate at the chair of Christoph Giroux. You're also a composer and a sound artist. Why are you here at this ETH chair? Yeah, so my background in electroacoustic composition led me here. Uh, I always worked with um, recorded sounds from the landscape and from architectural spaces. I did like radio pieces, audiovisual pieces and pieces in public space and was always in, in relationship to architectural space and landscapes. And so I started teaching here to kind of bring the sonic dimension into landscape architecture education. So before we dive into the sonic experience of exploring landscapes, I want to ask you about the chair of landscape architecture here. It's part of the Department of Architecture, so people who study architecture at ETH can choose to do a seminar or a dissertation or a master's in landscape architecture. For people who have no idea what that is, can you please explain in a short sentence? Well, what we teach here is the design of landscapes. It's also the history of landscapes and the media representation of landscapes. And that's what we do in the Media Lab. So it's about understanding like larger scales of, of spaces. So it's not necessarily linked to, you know, natural uh, landscapes, but really like cultural landscapes. You know, a city can also be a landscape, of course. And it's about uh, activating our senses to understand how landscape work, how they affect us uh, in our everyday life, um, not only through the eyes, but also through the ears. And that's what you teach students. Can you tell me about what uh, your teaching looks like or what it sounds like? Yeah, so we do elective courses um, called serendipity. So it's about things you encounter that you didn't expect to encounter. And um, we go to different places. So we started going to glaciers. Afterwards, we went to dams and infrastructure of water. But also we did some research on Japanese gardens and the urban space of Zurich. So very diverse spaces. We go there with our sound recorders and photograph cameras and uh, video cameras and laser scanners and so on. And then we try to portray these spaces in different sonic and visual perspectives. I want to focus on the glacier as first. So tell us about your excavation to the glacier with your students. What was that like? Or how did you bring serendipity in connection to the glacier? Yeah, so we started going to the Motoraj Glacier in 2015-16. It's a really accessible a glacier. You can arrive by train. And we went there with a big group of students and we walked up to the glacial tongue. And then um, we started to explore it with our underwater microphones and contact microphones and large format analog cameras. So the fascinating thing is from a glacier is that it's a really large object or phenomenon. And you can find very different acoustic and visual perspectives. And so the students kind of took the microphone and just hold them against the ice or we froze them also or we submerged underwater microphones into the glacial ponds. And you get like really unexpected sounds. The magical thing is you never know like before which sound you will record. And in that way, the glacier also becomes very alive in this serendipitous encounter. Can you play us some of the sounds that you collected in the glacier or with the glacier at the glacier? I guess it's inside, outside and on top. Yeah, it's it's mostly inside the glacier, actually. So this is a recording we did in the winter where it's, it's really quiet. But you have um, some air bubbles coming out of the glacial tongue where the glacial river flows. You said that you froze microphones into the glacier. 
what challenges did you have doing that? Because I know as an audio journalist, it's very difficult to handle batteries in cold climate. Yes. So first of all, we brought many batteries. The microphones we used were like really lo-fi, like we made them ourselves. It's just like piezoelectric microphones that we made waterproof. So it was also not a big problem if like cables got ripped, which happened sometimes. And so we tried to have like really resistant equipment. But later on, we also combined these recordings with very sophisticated underwater microphones where you can really capture the smallest details. But then what's actually in terms of sound really challenging in summer is that the glacier has a very, very large dynamic spectrum. So you have like very small, tiny sounds of like little air bubbles escaping the ice. But then you also have like the big chunks of ice breaking off. And so like to find this balance of the volume in between these like two extremes is really challenging. Can you play what you just described, both like the sophisticated sounds of every movement and the larger movements also? Yeah, so this is a collage of different recordings actually and it's called Inside Motorrad. What was that? A stone. Uh, yes, could be a stone. It's it's also hard to tell because if you like record these sounds, you don't see anything. Like it seems really active now when you listen to it, but when you stand in front of it, you're just looking into a little pond of melted ice, and you don't know what's actually going on. And you're also connected to the whole body of the glacier in a way. So like even like very distant sounds can can cause like larger events on the headphones and then you take off your headphones and you're wondering like where does that sound come from could it be dangerous for me so it's really interesting also the mix of auditive and visual perception one piece was recorded in march on a very warm day like way too warm for march and i just recorded this drone that is kind of created by the flow of the water uh, that kind of resonates in the ice And then you had like the, a larger chunk of ice breaking off in the back. And that is audible here in the piece called Drone. You captured all of these sounds together with your students in the past years in different seminars and excavations and you published records three records and also booklets with pictures of the glacier and actually you followed the metamorphosis of water from the glacier down to dams all the way down underground to the reservoirs in Zurich the books that you published together with records is called Bodies of Water a Swiss Landscape Trilogy and that's the title of the entire publication tell us about why The sounds you captured with your students, why you put them on vinyl records? Yes, yeah, so we really wanted to turn these very abstract and elusive phenomena into something tangible, something graspable. And so we tried to really make an object out of it that you can hold in your hands and if you have a record player, um, put it on your record player. Otherwise, just look at it also as an object. We also have digital downloads, by the way. It's not just the, the record. And another reason is the durability of the format. Vinyl is really one of the most long-lasting formats. They say a vinyl can last a uh, hundred years or longer. And it looks like glaciers won't last another hundred years in the Alps. So when all the glaciers are melted, at least we will have some records of them. Speaking about the melting glaciers, what do you read like on a scientific level from the sounds that you collect? Like, How do you interpret what you take home from a glacier like the Motorach Glacier? I mean, I'm not a scientist myself, but luckily now also glaciologists are starting to work with sound. And I think for like many scientific disciplines, there's really a bias towards in favor of visual informations. 
And what they found now is that you can not only determine the amount of melting, for example, also in, in Arctic glaciers, but you can, like from the frequency of the bubbles that escape the ice, you can determine the age of the ice. So really like each sound that the glacier makes also potentially like holds an information of the history of the snow, basically. The compression of the snow then determines the density of the ice and that helps to determine the age. So from our perspective, we didn't use like these recordings as scientific data. For us, it's much more about kind of an artistic approach to this phenomenon that can kind of complement scientific information. Speaking about art and this being an art project or an artistic project of exploring landscapes, I've mentioned before, but still, that the whole box with the records is accompanied by beautiful books, layouted beautifully, analog black and white pictures that the students took as well, aside from recording the sounds. What can art contribute to stopping climate change or to the awareness of climate change? Well, I think many of the phenomena of climate change, especially like in the global north, are like hard to grasp. And for me, for example, also before I did this project, I didn't really have an idea of like what a glacier is. I mean, I knew like how it works more or less, but I didn't have like a personal relationship to it. And I think through the images and the sounds, we get like really sensory access to an otherwise like really abstract phenomenon. And we can, yeah, really through an intimate way of, of encountering it through our ears, through like the delicate textures that we can, we can hear and also see. It somehow becomes alive in a way, you know, like it's not anymore like inanimate matter, like something passive, but it's something like really active. And so, I mean, without uh, anthropomorphizing it, it kind of almost becomes a person. The glacier, you mean, the like glacier. you hear it breathe and you hear it die, actually, if yes. you listen to the sounds of the melting ice. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So like what listeners describe when they hear it, you know, they have many associations. Also, like the other day, a listener, she described the, the experience of listening to the glacier, like uh, putting the ear on the womb of someone, like really listening into the body of someone. And yeah, you have these like very, very personal associations. And I think this is really important to kind of activate us that we don't only see all the problems because these things can be really paralyzing. And I think to also construct a positive relationship to these things that we need to protect is, is crucial. And this is what you give your students. So you s make them more sensitive to the topics and you make them see landscape with their ears. You give them a vocabulary to talk about what they feel and what they see and put that in relation to the landscape. Yes, and there the interesting thing is that I think it's kind of a discourse that we create between, you know, the students and the landscape. That's something that can later influence also their architectural practice. But it's not a discourse through words, but it's something like through artistic production. So like how they develop their pictures in the dark room, how they, they treat their sounds. It's always a statement. It expresses their own idea of the landscape and they can critique it or comment it or worship it. Or there are many ways of portraying a landscape and this helps to train the senses to like look and listen more carefully. But it also uh, has the potential to have a more critical look towards spaces and kind of reflect on your own position within them. I want to speak about the artistic use of what you captured in the glacier and the sounds that you collected so far. You're also a sound artist and you also perform with these three records. Can you tell us about how you use these sounds and how you produce art with actually documents of real nature? Yeah, so for me, it's really important that these recordings are not something sacred, like something that you just listen to from the outside, but that you'll really find a playful interaction with them. So what I do, for example, is I play in a formation called the Chuchipati Orchestra, which is a loudspeaker orchestra with like 32 landscape speakers from Nepal. 
and the musicians Patrick Kessler on the bass Julian Sartorius on the drums and Deep 13 on turntables they play along with the glacier so I play the records and, and different recordings through my laptop and controllers and they kind of respond to these sounds and find a way to communicate almost with the glacier you know like we really try to treat the glacier as another player so they pick up certain rhythms textures certain melodies also that emerge out of the glacier and so it becomes really like a collective concert by the musicians and the glacier <laughs> So in your course called Serendipity, you don't only collect sounds, but your students also have to take pictures with analog cameras. Tell us about what the difference is of capturing an image which actually seems frozen and sounds being something that are ongoing and that it's not just one brief moment, but it's a whole sequence of moments. Yes, um so we combine these these two techniques. At the end of the semester, the students present just one image and one minute of sound. That's always the format that we have. In the especially analog way of working with images, you also actually spend a lot of time on site. It really takes long, long hours until, especially in an environment like a glacier, you, you produce the image. But afterwards, you just have like a very still one moment of this place and you don't have the element of time in it time passing that's where the sound comes in it touches you maybe in a different way that an image does like literally you know like the sounds that reach your your eardrums and and your body they literally touch you so it has maybe something more physical involving more your body and the images give you yeah more references so you can really understand like how the space actually looks you can maybe connect it to more experiences than the sound you know it, it's much more graspable in a way but also like you you look at textures you can look at movement so there are also like many links between both elements and i think they can exist in a really equal way in our ways of perceiving so you look at a picture and you you hear a sound and kind of both exist for themselves independently but there's also something third that emerges in that encounter and that's where you come in also as a listener and a viewer and become active is one of your goals also that people become artists rather than architects some uh, students that uh, you know were our students in the past they went actually into that direction <laughs> which of course i really like But uh, I also hope that the students that actually become architects, that they can also bring something in from that practice, because I think especially architecture has so much potential of evolving all the senses. And I think sound is really not noticed enough and uh, the potential is really enormous, you know, of like the way how we perceive space, how we orient ourselves uh, in space, how we, you know, how larger the space seems through sound, but also really like the personal associations that we have when we listen to a place you know it's always connected to previous experiences we had in other spaces and especially because it's so subconscious unconscious there is a lot of potential to activate also these memories and the cultural signification of sounds and the relationship between different sounds you know architecture is really the composition of the everyday you know like i'm a composer too but i only play my music on speakers but architect actually build instruments <laughs> in a large format so they're like in terms of impact the much bigger composers so it's it's really great when they also listen and and work with sound consciously Thank 
Thank you very much, Ludwig Berger. Thank you for listening to the ETH podcast. This is a production of the Audio Bande. My name is Jennifer Kakshuri, and thank you for having me here as a guest at the Media Lab at the Chair of Landscape Architecture, Christophe Giraud. The publication we talked about is called Bodies of Water, a Swiss Landscape Trilogy, three booklets with photographs as well as three records. And you don't need a record player to listen to the sounds because there's also a download link right next to the records. Thank you very much.